do is to press that record button. So I'm now recording and we're, <clears throat> yeah. So today is the third day, a third and the final day of a Node.js bootcamp webinar. And today we're going to talk about the, a little bit more of, about web development, just a little bit because we did so well on the last session. It's almost nothing left for this session. We'll talk a lot about the tools, the, the Node.js tools, right? And we'll talk about the testing and deployment, everything that is related to well, everything that makes the difference between the prototype and the production application. Well, maybe not everything, but the most important parts, right? So uh, this session going to be structured slightly differently than the other, other ones, right? We will not be building, we will just build one a, a complete application. And after that, we'll be looking at the gazillion of small Node.js modules that are nevertheless quite useful. And you will find them quite useful during your uh, production work with Node. So let's jump in and just to start with, I want to introduce the first today, the Socket IO, which is the great little toolkit, great little library that simplifies so much the uh, communications between the client and the server in Node.js world, not only in Node.js world, in fact. So what is Socket IO? Socket IO is a simple library that allows you to remember streams, right? Socket IO allows you to do the same, but between the client, between the browser and the server. So just to show you how that thing works, I will uh, make right now a small chat application, just like we did with TCP IP chat, but this time I'm going to do the HTTP chat that you will be able, by the way, to join and see because we're on the same network. Uh, and I'll do that with the help of Socket IO. And I think it will take me maybe uh, roughly five, 10 minutes to code that was the explanation of the code. So what is socket IO? Socket IO is, let me first jump back to our node camp folder. So probably I'll go create a separate folder called chat right here, right? And uh, let's, let's add a couple of files, touch main.js and Let's create a folder called public. Also will be a good recap. What? Oh, yeah. I need to go to chat. It will be a good recap of what we did last time because I will start coding from Express and you will have a chance to remember uh, how Express worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there was a question in chat. Do we have possibility to watch recorded video from the last session? Yes. Uh, you should have received the email. I was sending it to everyone with the links to download and to watch the uh, last uh, last previous video. And this video will be recorded as well. So check your inbox. If, if it is not there, just drop me a mail and uh, I'll send you another link. Okay, so let's create a folder called public. This one will be for uh, our, well, HTML, JavaScript, CSS files. And uh, I'll just copy index HTML that we created on the previous session because it had some little skeleton HTML code there. Um, Indexed HTML here and let's make a folder source for client side JavaScript and well, SCR, it should be SRC, yeah. And let's create a little file called source app.js. So this will be my very simple setup. So I'll have, hmm, I should have done that in, in, in public, sorry. I'm a bit disoriented right now. So public, let's move index HTML to public. And let's move source to public as well. Okay, so here we'll create main.js file. This will be our server. Okay, so now we have main.js and the public folder. That's exactly the setup that I want to start with. And uh, we're pretty much ready to uh, start installing, installing the dependencies. So in this case, I'm doing npm install save express. I will need express and I will need socket IO. You can do the same by the way. And this is going to be enough for me to start this little application. Okay, it will take, yeah, it's already there. Today, my internet is surprisingly better than the last time. So let's open main.js. 
and let's build a very quick express and socket io application right now right here so uh starting from http http will give us the http server right we need also express because we need to serve file somehow and what we'll also need is we need socket io socket io socket.io like this okay so now let's create our basic infrastructure for serving http um, to to the clients so what we're we gonna do um let's create server and remember create server accepts the listener right the listener that will respond to http requests and response and that listener will be the express application right so we need to create that as well app equals express and we can pass that application to the uh to our server and finally we can set up the application to do something useful so app use express static we will ask it just to serve the static files from the public folder and here gonna be like this dear name plus public yep this should work and don't forget to start the server let's listen to port 88 you're gonna be good okay so that's our minimalistic Express JS application. I hope you remember how all this middleware things work together, how uh, Express passes the request through the middlewares until there is one middleware that actually can answer that request. And I will start it with node mon just to make sure it's updated each time that I'm changing the code in this folder. My node mon will restart the server. Okay, and we'll open the browser, localhost 8080 will give me my um what's up what's that console oh main css is not there but i don't really care about css so this will give me my uh index html file okay so now let's write just a very basic client side js right so i've got this uh, app js that is loaded this is my entry point for javascript so i want to write a little chat so to make a super small minimalistic chat i will need some sort of the chat area ID equals chat. I need an input. Let's give it ID say. And I need a button. Too many letter T's in the button. Called say. And ID called send. So this is my minimal setup. Let me actually add something so that I see that the list is on the screen. Hello world. And I'll remove the CSS just for the sake of keeping my console clean. I don't like those red messages. So did I save? Oh, I was I probably was editing wrong index HTML. Give me a second. Uh, node camp chat so here I was editing the wrong file but that's quite easy to fix here's my HTML so let's see if that works okay so I've got the uh, very basic uh, example for saying something and displaying the messages so now I'll write some client-side JavaScript to support that example and then we'll jump back to node GS magic okay so what do I do I need something like function on chat message right so whenever i receive a chat message with some text what i will do i will add this text effectively to this unordered uh, unordered list so let's write something like this is the id chat okay chat list document Curie selector and just chat. Okay, that works. List item document create element. Let's create list item. Let's add 
inner HTML to this list, list item with the text. And finally, uh, chat list append child, as far as I remember, list item. Not using any sort of jQuery or uh, things like that, just to keep things as minimalistic as possible. This is a new message. So by the way, if you see some errors in my API, DOM API usage, just let me know. I'm not quite sure if that will, yeah, it works from the first time, which is great. Okay, and the second function will use it called send message. We'll connect it to the server in a second. So send message will be executed whenever we click the button, right? So let's do the following. Let's take the value out of this text field. Text field is called say. Uh, say field document query selector by ID say and value will be say field value and let's just print it for now because we haven't yet connected to server in any way print it to console actually we can print it to on chat message just append it back value and finally let's clear the field afterwards okay this one is easy okay so let's see if that works oh yeah i need to add the event listener to the button in order for this to work so um const button let's get the button query selector what was the name? Send. Send and button add event listener on click. Actually, it would be better to make it a submit event on the form, but whatever, we're not writing too much of a production code here. So uh, this is a, a, a click event, and on the click event, we'll just be we'll be sending message. Actually, I can just register it, it as event listener straight away. Send message. Yeah, like this. So let's see if that works. Hello. Let's increase a little bit the, the interface. Okay, so, yep, it works. Okay, so uh, I've got the very basic chat infrastructure. Took me five minutes to code on the uh, client side. Now, how would I take this chat and make it a, a real real time web chat so that uh, you guys can also join and connect of, of course with uh, things like so socket io this is going to be quite easy so socket io provides you the event listener interface so main js here it's the server app js here is a client and on main js i want to provide uh, this interface to connect from the client so socket io acts as this, as the socket as event listener and event emitter but instead of emitting events on the same virtual machine just subscribing and publishing you emit events to the server or from the server to the client basically the details of the protocol uh, is becoming transparent for you. I mean, you probably know the story about Ajax and real-time web, right? So people always wanted to make this cool self-updating pages. Whenever you receive the update, like notification about the new mail, your page updates, and you don't have to wait or refresh the page manually or do some other actions, right? And there were many approaches how to do that. There were, was approach like uh, constantly pulling the server with Ajax requests. Do you have something for me? Do you have something for me? Do you have something for me? But of course, that introduced latency, that introduced an overhead because most of the time people were not getting any messages back, especially if it's some sort of a mail server that might show you a new mail icon once per day or so. So it introduced loads of overhead, right? Um, then people use, were using flash sockets, so opening the permanent connection from flash to the server because um, HTML5 standard didn't have anything good for it. And finally, people introduced things like uh, web sockets. And web sockets are so great because you can keep the uh, running connection to the server and receive the notification from the server without reconnecting over and over and over again. So it saves you loads of energy. However, WebSockets is still not fully like 
uh, standard that is available everywhere. There are still browsers that are not very nice with WebSockets. Besides, there is some technical difficulties sometimes with proxy servers that make uh, WebSockets not that reliable transport. So Socket IO in this terms is a great uh, thing. It is a great library because it will try first the most uh, guaranteed way to connect to the server, which is Ajax. So instantly you will get that communication channel to the, to the server and you can start posting messages, receiving messages back. If Socket IO figures out that there is a way to upgrade your transport, so to use the better transport, again, it will seamlessly switch that transport for you, right? But you will not know about that. You'll see the API is quite uh, straightforward. You don't have to uh, care about transport details like at all. Okay, so let's initialize the Socket IO server, right? To do that, we will need to use uh, Socket IO will need to use the HTTP server that we already used. So let's say IO equals Socket IO with this server. So now Socket IO kind of wraps this server and it will intercept the requests that are intended for Socket IO, not general HTTP requests. And since Socket IO is a listener, an event listener, we can just start writing our logic. Okay, I've got something. Uh, is there any difference between the socket IO and uh, web sockets module, for example? That's a great question. So the difference between socket IO and uh, the implementation of, I'm, I'm not, um, to be honest, I haven't really worked too close with uh, web WS module, right? But I assume this is just implementation for web sockets, purely web sockets. Well, socket IO, it uh, gives you, firstly, it gives you higher level of abstractions like the rooms, right? So you can group, uh, for example, your recipients by the rooms and uh, send the message to that rooms. It gives you the abstraction of, uh, the uh, and also it, it provides you the abstractions ab above more than just web sockets. So it will use web sockets if available, but if not, it will use Ajax and it will uh, fall down to the uh, simpler and more guaranteed transport. So uh, socket IO is a little bit more complex, I would say, not complex, but a little bit more powerful framework in terms that it can do more. It can provide you transport even if you're working with some crappy old phone that just supports the basic Ajax requests. So, but yeah, I'll, I'll double check that module. Probably will be able to transfer you with more, more details. Okay, uh, let's jump back to our IO. So IO, it is this so, uh, event emitter, right? Remember how we used, how we were building the TCP IP chat. The idea is totally the same on connection. What we will have, we will have a listener that listens whenever there is a client that connected. How it connected, we don't care. But what we will receive is SOC, socket. This SOC is an object that is your abstraction layer of like talking between the server and the client. Again, you don't know what is the connection details right now. You don't know uh, anything about the, the ways that communication work, but this is your abstraction layer. So what do you need to do to send the message to this uh, client? You just emit it. So you emit something, let's call it MSG, this something. This is, by the way, completely arbitrary. You can put there any identifier that you like. If it is a type of the message that you're sending. And I'll say, hi there. Okay. And on the server side also, just to have some sort of a feedback that I've got the connection. I'll write somebody connected. Yeah. So, um, yeah, my node mon is monitoring my uh, my updates and it will print me something if there is something interesting happens. So that's our very basic socket IO server. Since node mon is all green, it means at, le at least I don't have any kind of a, uh, errors and syntax errors. So now on the client side, I'm ready to start connecting to, the, to that server. So let's have another script. And for source, we'll put socket IO, socket IO GS. Notice this little thingy, right? So if I open my project right now, here's my project, right? There is nothing like socket.io folder in this project, right? So, and there is no file that is called socket.io.js. So, how does that happen that socket IO? 
uh, so that, that the client will receive that file. So I'll refresh this page right now, right? You see there is no errors, so the file was loaded and Hey, why it's not printing that somebody connected? Oh yeah, because I'm not connected yet. And this file was in the, indeed found. So think about it a little bit. How would you do that, right? How would you hide the file that is not there and serve it to the client? Just think for yourself. And uh, at the end of this section about Socket, I will tell uh, how you can do that technically, right? So let's jump back. So now let's connect. Let's go back to RabGS and on this side, all you need to do is just Right, this line of code, right? And that should be pretty much enough to connect to the server. Let's refresh. IO is not defined very good. Um, what was the constructor? Should be just I, you know? Hmm. Socket IO. AppGS point one. Ha. Huh. How comes? Sorry. Um, have I loaded that file? Indeed. Yeah, I should have the socket IO GS. And well, now it's gone. Probably was cached or something. Okay, so, okay, yeah. So basically somebody connected. It means that I have an established connection between the client and the server. And now with the help of magic of socket IO, I can start subscribing to the messages from the client. So let's say that whenever I have the message that I receive from the server, this message will have some sort of a text. And what I can do, I can say on chat message. So whenever, actually, again, I don't even need to wrap it into the separate function. I can just say on chat message. Okay, so whenever there is something sent by the uh, server, I can uh, receive it back and print it on my little what the heck? Oh, sorry, sock on. There is a little mistake here. So th this, by the way, this little messages here, they are caused by the restarts of the server in the back background, right? So my server is restarting and at the same time, uh, my client is trying to reconnect. So that's why these error messages appear. So they are fine. So hi there is the thing that I just sent from the server, right? And I have this little communication channel already going on. And everything that I now need to do is to send back the, uh, the chat messages to the server and emit them back to all the clients that I have right now connected. So, and this will pretty much conclude the basic chat example. And Socket IO, of course, is not limited to chats. We have been building quite successful production applications with Socket IO and uh, using it to transmit the updates for the charts for the real time data and all kind of uh, other things whenever you need you need of uh, communication real time communication between the client and the server socket io will probably be your friend okay so now let's finish our little example uh, send message so instead of just printing the message what we will do we'll say soc emit message so we're sending that to the server. We're sending this value to the server. Okay, so now server will start receiving these messages. Okay. And for this chat to be finished, what we need to do whenever from the server side, whenever we are receiving the message from the client, what we'll do? Well, We'll take the text of that message and we will emit it to everybody else. io.emit means send it to everybody. So SOC is your connection to one particular client that has just connected. IO is your connection to everybody else, right? Remember in TCP IP network chat, we had to 
uh, take care of the connections ourselves. We had to track who is connected right now. We had to make sure that uh, we're not trying to send the messages to somebody uh, who is already disconnected. Socket.io handles it for you. So IO emit will pretty much broadcast it to everyone. So, and that should be it. So now let's see. So after restarting the server a little bit, I'll say it and I'm receiving it back. So let's check if that works for you as well. Um, presentation and if config, my IP gonna be, I've got so many, my IP gonna be, where's my IP? Oh yeah, here it is. This should be my IP address. Let me put it somewhere in the code. So try to open this thingy on port 8080. You should be able to connect and say something to that server just for the sake of, of the test. Oh yeah, hi. So I don't know, by the way, about the latency for you guys. Hi there. But uh, yeah, I'm in China, so probably this is as, as bad as you can get. So if you're somebody uh, somewhere in Europe, this round trip between the time that you're clicking the button and the time that you receive back the message is the pretty much the worst case that somebody's trying the, <laughs> the, the weird non-English. One second delay, yeah, that, that's pretty much what, what you would expect because, uh, because of all the uh, like connections, which, because of the distance, because of the firewalls and the proxies and the uh, VPNs. So that's probably the worst <laughs> that you can get on the earth. I don't think that you can get ever worse. Okay, so it is... Yeah, uh, good morning for everybody who is in the morning time. We're now in 5.30 p.m., so it's evening for us, and thanks God it's Friday. So uh, we just built a little chat application in uh, Socket.io, and again, just look at the code. The amount of code that we had to write is quite little. Of course, it's not the uh, production-level code yet because we're not handling the disconnects properly. We probably should we should do that. There's no authentication whatsoever, so we don't know who you are. I don't see who is posting those messages. So once you start building the real app, you will have to write a little bit more code. And there is usually uh, already the infrastructure and modules that will help you to do that. So for example, fetching the session data from Express and marrying it with Socket.io is not a big problem at all. Uh, besides, if you want to scale to to a bigger size, uh, you can do that as well. So uh, Socket IO supports on the server side, it supports uh, scaling with the Redis backend, right? So you will store the Socket IO data in, in, in Redis, and this way you can have several nodes, several Node.js instances, uh, even potentially across the different machines uh, connected to that Redis cluster and uh, coordinating through Redis and sending the messages back and forth through Redis. So it is a scalable uh, approach for web development. And again, I want to stress, we, we tested in production with uh, thousands of users uh, online in real time receiving the data streams for the charts for the financial data. So it works. Okay, good. I hope that you liked the uh, socket IO part. It was like a a little bit relaxing thing just to get you back into the uh, into Node.js thing. So now let's talk a little bit about how to make our applications a little bit more production ready and all those little things that you usually do not do during the prototyping and uh, during the POCs, but you have to do that if you want to live long and happy life in production. If you want your DevOps and your uh, support to love you and like you, then you have to take care of one thing that is logging for sure, right? So let's jump, jump straight in. There is several things that you can do and don't want to even to talk about the console log. You can you can do that, of course, but uh, it's not something that you will want to do uh, for obvious reasons. It's not scalable. It's not configurable. Uh, it's uh, it's again it's slow. So there is the better ways to do that. And in Node.js, I don't remember if I mentioned that already. Probably I mentioned that on the first. Uh, day of the webinar in npm right now there is 300 thousand modules 
not the packages, but modules. So uh, versions don't count, actually. They do not contribute to that number. So there is a huge amount of modules. There's all, all kind of hello worlds. But uh, for each and every task that is common in development, you will have like four, five, six different modules that implement that task with the various degrees of success. So uh, I encourage you to just jump in whenever you have like a minute and you want to do something with the existing module, just start typing. If you have if you have found a great module like Winston, this is a module for logging. Before you start using that, just go to Google and type Winston versus and don't type anything else. Just leave VS, right? Once you hit enter, you will see like a bunch of threads asking like, is Winston better than something else and ABC, right? And you will have a chance to draw your own conclusions. So uh, in this session, we're quite short on time, but I want to show you just a couple of modules that can help you with debugging, oh, sorry, with the uh, logging. And one of them is called Winston. This is, oopsie, that's for the different webinar. Um, one of them is called Winston and the other one is called debug. So let's start from installing Winston. Um, where's my console? Sorry, I, I got totally lost with my terminals. Yeah, here it is. Here's my terminal. Cool. So, that, Jesus Christ, I don't want to jump to that table. Okay, so, awesome. So, I'll shut down the server. And, by the way, you can see this, like, console thingy. It starts trying to connect. So, it lost the connection, lost the hope, and it tries to reestablish the connection through the um, HTTP, through Ajax uh, polls. So, it will succeed once I'm back. So, Socket.io has a great reconnect strategy. Okay, so, Winston. Getting back to Winston. npm install save Winston. Don't forget to save. Again, the module is not that big. It's going to be easy to do. So Winston is the thing that um, produces the, the logs that are more made for machine recognition, right? They, Winston by default writes logs in JSON format. It can write to console a norm, normal human readable format, but the biggest win is that you can parse logs with uh, that are written with JSONs. Okay, so let's add logging to our application. So we'll add Winston. And just as you would expect from a normal logger, you need to configure it. Let's add another transport, another logger. Winston trans transports file. Let's add the file and let's add the configuration. So this is the transport that you're adding. The second part is the uh, configuration for that particular transport. So what I want to have is the file name will be um, app.log. Okay, so I have configured my very basic login. Without it, by the way, it will still write to console as far as I remember. And now we can, um, let's add the listener here. So whenever we're starting the application, we will write that application has started. Winston info app has started. Let's also just to make it more interesting. Instead of console logging somebody connected, will Winston info somebody connected. Again, this is quite trivial. So don't expect too much of a surprises here. Node mon main. But oh, consolvents. Ah, what I'm thinking. Sorry, const. I love those typos when you typo the whole word. So here's our. And by the way, you know why this thing is are happening here? Because probably some of you have their web browser still open on the same page, right? So uh, Socket, I will try to reconnect on the regular intervals. Right now, since I'm back, your page is reconnected to, uh, to my server. And here's our app log. Let's look at it. There's nice little JSON formatted messages, timestamps, and everything that you might need for your application logging purposes. So that's one way to add your logs. Uh, the other way is, so 
Winston it will be for for me it will be the weapon of choice if I'm writing like the application the proper app if I'm just writing some sort of a library a little toolkit and I don't need logging per se right the only reason why I need logging is probably to debug things right to to make sure that they work properly there's another little module called debug right so when you don't want to shoot with the cannon there is a smaller size weapon uh, npm install save debug and don't be confused it's a logger it's not a debugger and I'll show you how it works so it works in a super lightweight easy way the only thing that you need to to do is pretty much to export it and to tell which module are you are, are in right now so const debug will require it and we'll say that this is main right or app whatever and now we can write to that debugger anything that we want so debug about to configure logging uh whatever registering listeners so it's really like a trace debug trace output format right so now if we run the application again node main you will not see this debug output at all right so how to trigger that on you can say debug equals app whatever is uh, that you configured inside and this way you're telling I want to turn on the debug messages for this part of my application and uh, let's start the app and here's your debug output right so use this for small libraries for small tools that you just need sometimes to uh, to make sure that you have a way to output the logging information but generally it is not required something like let, let me think of the utility let's say that you, you build the utility to generate the random strings it doesn't need logging per se right but it might be a good idea to have some debugging uh optional debugging turned on or off for the sake of figuring out what's wrong right so if your friend is saying it doesn't work you can tell him run it this way and tell me what it prints and then you will figure out what's wrong with the application so this is the second little tool uh, and I often also find it handy again the debug and Winston are two completely different grade of tools first is one uh, is for tracing and little debug messages the second one is the full-blown logger okay so that's for the logging add logs add lots of logs but you probably know that already more than more logs is better more logs is better than less words okay <laughs> um what's next let me quickly jump to the presentation and figure out what's next by the way the basic uh basic examples that i'm showing on the screen are also duplicated as usual they are duplicated on the slides maybe slightly differently uh, if i mistype something or name things differently but uh, the main ideas are uh, duplicated in uh, in the presentation so feel free to jump in and uh, grab those examples and try yourself after the uh, webinar i'm sharing the presentation all the time okay so configuration the other great thing if you're starting to build poc you can live without it once you start well that's great sorry um macbook integration with the phone is amazing so it starts to ring right in the middle of webinar on the screen so uh the next thing that you will need to do is to uh, support some sort of configs right to support the configurations for different environments to support the configurations for different users etc and so on and uh, again in node.js there is a little nice module that i will right now install npm install and conf don't forget save so what nconf does it is again it, it is very minimalistic thing to lo uh, load configs from the json file and what it does it pretty much provides you the way to fetch the configs to configure the default values and uh, do all those little things that the configurator uh, usually do right so uh, again it's not the silver bullet and there are there is a 
good opinion that I kind of agree with that uh, configuration in JSON format is not good at all because JSON is not a format for configuration. And the main reason is that you cannot add the comments to keep the valid JSON. If you add the comment in JSON, it will not be a valid JSON anymore. So you can't do that. So either you have to live with keeping your configuration super self-explanatory or you move to the different format. But still, nconf is a nice little module and I want to highlight it in this little webinar. So let's add it. Um, you know what, probably I'll start removing the parts of the previous code just because if I keep everything on the screen, it will just take loads of space and we will not be able to focus on the uh, on really what we are doing right now. So yeah, it looks like everything else is moved. Okay, so nconf. nconf, we require it. And the next thing to do is you need to tell how you want to load your configuration. And a very typical way that like most applications load the config, they accept the configuration from three configuration options, from three sources, right? So at least three sources. Firstly, you have the arguments. So uh, oftentimes you want to support the arguments for your application so you can overwrite something. Uh, secondly, you will probably support something like environment variables. And uh, thirdly, you will probably want to support the file as well. And uh, for the most apps, the priority is as follows. You load the file, but you can overwrite file with environment variables and you can overwrite environment variables with arguments. So let's, let's implement this configuration for nconf. So nconf, nconf. Then we say we want to get argv. It's the most critical thing, arguments. Then we want to get environment. And then we want to get file. And for file, we want to get it from some sort of a path. Here you need to provide the full path to the file, right? So how to get it? So, well, we can use this thingy, dear name. Again, let me copy paste it. And let's call it app or chat.conf. So right now, I will be able to load the configuration from that file and then cure it. So what kind of config you might want? Let's say we want to use something like a port to configure. So how we will get it? We'll say nconf, please give us the parameter called port, or better, let's, let's call it api.port, something like this. Let's make it nested. So with the uh, columns, you separate the nested parts of the configuration. So in the log file, we need to create a log file for the thing to work. It will be just API and here we'll put port. So hopefully, chat conf, chat JSON, let's call it JSON to make sure that we're consistent. And here, chat JSON. It will load the configuration. It will take that parameter out of the config. So let's check it out. Um, loading, sorry, using port and port. Okay. And here we'll use this port. Just to make sure that we're not cheating, let's put it 9090. Okay. And again, node main. Using port 9090, this is our port, right? Oftentimes you will want to provide some default values for the configuration, right? So you will want, you don't want to make your users write each and every configuration key. You want to give some meaningful defaults, right? You can do that as well with the uh, help of nconf, as well as during the fetch time, you can also provide the default values. So that's your way to organize the configuration for node apps. There are other modules as well, but well, this one, according to the popularity, at least on GitHub, this one is quite heavily used again. I used it on a few projects. It was, I mean, configuration of the thing that you usually load on the startup and then you forget about it and it just works. So with nconf, 
it's it's this case it just works <laughs> so okay so we now know how to uh, create a simple chat we know how to add the login to this chat and we know how to add the configuration to this chat so uh what will be our next thing that we will want to do with with any kind of application that uh, we're loading so let's um well, we might want to do one of two things. We either want to scale it or we want to uh, do the testing. Probably, you know what, probably I'll start from the testing, even though in the presentation, uh, the first part is the scaling. Somehow testing right now looks more logical for me because it's now coming to production and testing is a part of production. Actually, I should have introduced testing long before that, right? And uh, advocate TDD, but I'll start advocating TDD now. <laughs> so. Testing. How do you do testing with Node.js? Pretty much, I'm sure that since you are already front-end engineers, uh, chances are you did some testing on uh, your client-side code, right? You do testing on client-side code, do you? <laughs> and uh, the frameworks that are used in JavaScript world are often like they often support the both sides. They support both client-side and server-side. Pretty much, the reason is that for unit testing, you do not have to rely on some browser features or on the transport or on visuals unit testing is a testing of logic so <laughs> good one um so let's uh, let's remember what we did last time I'll, I'll probably finish with our chat application for now hide this one and and this one and uh let's remember the previous session we were doing the apis and we were doing the little express uh, app to uh, to give us the the list of the books right so let's go there remember what were the files so we had the file called api.js right this is a little bit harder to test so we'll test it last uh, this one it was using the uh, the router express router to uh, to do the routes right so we generally want to test this logic right because this is the main logic of our app the second thing is look at this thing here right so one of the things that you will want to do when you're building such an app is to extract this logic to the um, external place and uh, well make sure that the storing is not mixed with the routing and uh, getting the parameters from the url it's just the different concerns so let's separate those concerns and uh, why i want to do that right now well because i want to demonstrate to you the tdd test driven development so let's try to write tests first in node.js and then write the logic to support that test and see how that works if that works okay so firstly so what I want to do, I want to create a little class for storing the uh, items for my REST API. So I'll do that. I will not implement the whole class. It will take just too much time of webinar, so I'll just implement a couple of functions. But you'll get the idea. So um, call it item store.js. OK, so and uh, just to make sure that I have something to export, I'll export something. So. Let's create class item store. Oops. And module exports item store. Okay, amazing. Now let's make our test folder. Okay. And now, which framework will we use for testing? So again, there are a bunch of different frameworks. I will show you how to work with Mocha. The alternative is Jasmine. There is also NUnit. There is also QUnit. Mocha and Jasmine seems to be the most popular ones so far. Between these two, I will not even try to give you the, uh, the winner. So again, up to you to decide. I'm, I'm with Mocha. So you might use Jasmine as well. It's also a great framework. So. And in test, I will create a file called um, item store test GS. Okay, so how do we approach testing? Since this is no GS, we will definitely need to uh, export the to require the the store the thing that we are about to test so let's get this constructor item 
item store. Okay, and now here's the syntax how you how you write tests in Mocha. So you describe it's a little bit BDD driven style, but doesn't really change much. So item store. This is the our test case. And here's the function that belongs to this test case. So here we will describe the individual tests. So it should initially return empty array. Something like this. And here will be our test case. Okay, awesome. So just to start with, I'll say that store is the new store. And I'll call this function all. I know this function doesn't exist, but like who cares? That's steady D. So initially test should be green. Uh, this is store all. How do I check for the uh, if, if my assertion is true or false? There is a bunch of ways. And the first way that I will show you is assert module of Node.js. Basically, you can just throw an exception if you like, but there is an assert module that uh, makes us a little bit more semantic, a little bit more neat. And assert is a standard module of Node.js. You don't have to download it. So let's assert um, equals, as far as, far as I remember. Um, so I'm getting books from store, store books length going to be GTH. Yeah. So book length is going to be null, oh, sorry, zero. So uh, let's see if that works. So in order to test it, right, I can do one of two things. I can do npm install minus G mocha. If you run it, it will run global installation of Mocha and you will have Mocha in your command line. So you can now run Mocha and it's configured by default to grab the uh, subfolder called test in your project and uh, find all the JavaScript files there and treat them as the uh, test cases. So it will just execute it. And uh, here's my little report. Should, should initially ret return empty array and one is failing. The other way, the proper way and much better way to do that is to take your package JSON, right? Find the place that is called scripts and add here the, sorry, misclicked. So add here the, just the, the same call to Mocha, right? So this way you're hiding a little bit the details of how exactly you're testing. This test script is again, by uh, by convention, this is one of the script that the uh, pretty much every module will have. And uh, by default, if I, if I download something from internet and I want to work with it and uh, I want to make sure that it's not broken just initially, what I will run is npm test and it will execute that script pretty much give me the same results, right? So that's how it works. Now let's just for the sake of uh, being a little bit more complete, let's also show how to uh, implement something Let's implement the code actually. Let's make our test green. I want a green test all. And let's have a constructor here. And inside of the constructor, let's say this store is empty and all will return this store, something like that. Actually, I will call it all sync, right? Because by default, everything should be asynchronous, right? So all sync. Let's see if my tests work now. NPM test, building the right habits. What failing? Book is not defined. Okay. Books, books. Yeah. The test was failing, but for the different reason. So I had an error in text. Assert equals is equal, maybe. Not quite sure. Is equal. NPM test, I'll oh, just be green, please. Okay, so what do you do usually in this kind of cases? Node assert. 
go there and check. Uh, equal, not equals. Okay. So now you must be green. NPM test. Yeah, it's green, it's passing, and uh, everything's great. So, a few more things. Just in, like in every other uh, unit test framework, you will have the hooks, right? So, if I will start to write the second, actually, let's start, let's write a little second uh, function, right? Let's say that we want to add the item, and the item should should appear back in the uh, in the list of items, and that can be all our test case that we will write. So, it should add the item. And this will be the asynchronous test, right? So how do I approach the asynchronous test? Const store equals new store. I want to add something to the store. A book, for example. And I want to receive back the callback that will tell me that the item has been successfully added. For example, so how do I approach the asynchronous test? How how will Mocha know that the test has ended? Because this will return before I know the results. This function will be uh, finished before I know the results. If you add the parameter called done, then Mocha will pass here the function that you need to call as a callback when everything is done for this unit test. So here you just call done, and obviously here you can put the uh, checks with the assertions if this. Uh, if your conditions really met or they didn't meet, right? So, a couple more things to mention. There is hooks before each. For example, might be a nice place to have the initialization like this one, right? Let's store. And here, store equals new store. So, if you have some repetitive code to set up the unit test, you can put it to in before each, and this will be executed before each and every test case here. Also, you have the hook called before that is executed once before the whole suit. And the same similarly, uh, you have after and after each to do that. Right? Again, if you're doing unit tests in uh, Node.js, I will not suggest you to do that with the assertion library that is JS maybe, uh, that is bound with node, that is default module, I would highly recommend using something like Chai. Chai has much richer uh, set of the assertions and it supports several uh, ways, several syntaxes. Again, just for the sake of saving some time because we're running out of time faster than I thought, uh, I will just show it from the uh, homepage and let you guys experiment with Chai. So Chai supports three styles of the assertions, is BDD style should, expect and assert is no GS style, right? So. Uh, here's the fancy syntax like expect something to be a string. So it enhances the object that you have and uh, gives you these additional little building blocks that you can use for building your unit test. Frankly, I'm a little bit old school, so I'm going with this syntax. Uh, and what I just like about this syntax, about this, uh, sorry, about this assertion library, it is it has many, many asserts that are quite frequently required on top of what uh, Node.js has by default. For example, you can assert that the returned collection contains the certain element, or you can assert the deep values, or you can assert with respect to the types or uh, with disrespect <laughs> for the types. So this is, again, a nice little addition to test-driven development and to test in Node.js that uh, you usually will want to have in your applications. Okay, great. So we're hitting the middle of this session. Let's uh, do a very quick water tea and um, something else, I don't know, <laughs> email breaks and uh, come back in 10 minutes and uh, continue. And in the second half of the session, I'll show you how to start Node.js processes. And if we're lucky, I'll also show you how to use Grunt, which is a task runner, something like the Ant and uh, Maven from Java World or Nant from, uh, from, from C Sharp World. So see you in uh, just 10 minutes and stay tuned.
Okay, guys, I hope that uh, everybody's back and uh, we're ready to continue with exploring other cool stuff uh, about Node.js. So uh, the next thing that uh, I want to talk about will be the way that you're executing the Node.js processes and the way that you run it. So you've probably already understood that it is usually not a great idea if you will, well, just start um, running node and the name of the application it's it's like slow for the development purposes it's too it takes too much time to just alt up to the terminals and go back and uh, from like from production purposes it's also it's not a great way to uh, run your node.js app why well because sometimes servers restart sometimes the processes crash you will want to uh to see what's happening with your processes and to monitor them and especially these days with all this boom about like microservices and uh, node.js especially being such a lovely virtual machine for microservices it has such a small footprint you can spawn all those node.js machines so easily there's frameworks even for node.js like seneca uh like targeted specifically for microservice architecture and with microservices you will have like five, six, seven, ten, fifty uh, different processes that will build and it will make together your application. So, what is the better ways to run Node.js? That's the subject for the next few minutes of this webinar. So, firstly, I showed you one already, but I want to stress that this is a good way for the development purposes and probably only for development processes is Nodemon. So you install this global module, it monitors the current folder and reloads the application as you go. So I will not start the application and show you how it works because we were doing it pretty much for the whole webinar. The other great way to do that is the global module, global tool called PM2. And by the way, this was opened in my browser. This is the home of PM2 with a quick start guide. I wanted to share this link again because we, we don't really have that much time on the webinar to go through all the options and show you everything that you can do with PM2. But on this webinar, I just want to show you the basic things that you can do with PM2. So what is PM2 to start with? PM2 st stands for Process Monitor, and uh, it is made to monitor, spawn, uh, check the health, and uh, start, restart, manage, Process Manager, sorry, not Process Monitor, Process Manager, uh, manage the Node.js processes. So how do you run things with PM2? So let's 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 probably jump. No, let, let's use our ExpressJS uh, app with the books example. Let's actually use both. So uh, firstly, let's go and run. So PM2 PM2 will be a global command line tool, and let's start something like ExpressJS is our entry point for the old application. Let's start it. So now. You see it started somewhere, right? It's not holding my console anymore. And uh, here I have a nice little table reporting the status of my processes. Okay, awesome. Just for the sake of being fancy, let's go to our chat app and PM to start main.js as well. So now I have two running processes. Right, and if at some point I want to monitor and see what is happening, I can type things like PM2 list, and here's my processes. Right, so uh, I can see the a little bit more information than uh, from the console. Of course, I can see the statuses, I can see the PIDs, uptime, like the consumed memory, and I can do even more interesting things. I can do things like PM2, PM2. As far as I remember, it's mon monit. Yep, here's the monitor of my processes, right? So you can see the load, like zero, nothing is doing anything. So if you you can imagine, if, if you're running on a production thing and on your box there is like seven or eight Node.js processes that must be in the like running at the same time to for you to for your application to work. Then monitoring that with the default tools going to be a bit of a pain. You don't want to type top and everything. So what else you can do? You can ask to. Firstly, you want you might uh, ask about the details of the concrete. Firstly, I want to have a list again. Okay, so. 
this is the, their names this is their ID so I can ask for the details of a particular running process let's say I want to take ID 0 and show it so here's much more details right about this process what I can also do I can ask npm oh, npm pm to stop all I want to halt them right so now they are stop it and just the same way npm start all I mean what um I cannot start all npm start exp hmm, missing oh yeah there must be a, a, a script in in um in packet json to do that so yeah pm2 <laughs> so the other good thing that you can do with pm2 you can pre-configure you can create the configuration file the yaml file for pm2 and uh, describe in the file what are exactly the set of the uh, processes that you need to start with what parameters with what environment variables and with uh, what kind of the configurations right so uh, pm2 does that pm2 can also it's a good idea to set it up as the on the restart of the server so this way if you're like creating something like the amazon instance that uh during the startup it will automatically launch the configured services for that instance that's another place for pm2 to be used one more thing let's pm2 delete all a pm2 start exp yay running so this is pad let's now do one thing let's let's see if this thing is really working so let's local local host where was it 1990 api books what why is it not running it should be running oh yeah maybe it's 8080 i don't remember probably 8080 yeah Okay, so how do you usually kill your processes? Let's be brutal. Okay, so awesome. I just killed it. And well, guess what? It's back again because PM2 makes sure that it is healthy and it just restarted this thing. Oh yeah, I was uh, yeah. I, I see now. Th thanks for the hint. I was mistyping it, right? So I was. Oh crap! NPM NPM startle. Yeah, it was PM two startle, not NPM startle. Thanks. That was a stupid typo. So uh, PM two is your process manager for Node.js. Is your thing to make sure that you can keep track of the zoo of the processes that are running on your box. And this is the thing that you will usually put into the uh, startup of your server so that whenever your machine is, whenever you're increasing the amounts of machines, for example, or whenever your uh, your server has restarted and it's back online, that your processes are all back together and they are running nicely and smoothly. So uh, this is one way well, probably it is the industry standard to run something in production. So you never, ever, ever run just Node.js and uh, start the server this way. You usually use something like PM2. Well, not something like actually use PM2. So uh, now you know how to run Node.js in production. You know how to unit test and uh, you know how to write the chat as well. So what's the next thing that we will talk about? We know how to configure as well. So let's talk a little bit about the scaling, right? So one of the things that is a common misconception about Node.js is that, well, Node.js is single-threaded. What does it mean that the, well, the only thing that you can utilize to its maximum is a single core right so what will happen if you want to use more than just one core of your server right what if you want to use like two cores or like preferably all cores so you want to use as much as possible by the way these days it's 
we, again, with the make microservices trends, um, it's getting more and more popular to just run one service per virtual machine on Amazon, right? And use just the single core, single CPU machine for for everything. That not really that big of a deal. So anyway, but it's good to know how to scale Node.js vertically, how to increase the amount of instances running on the same machine and how to, uh, well, work with Node.js processors, right? Because Node.js has a sweet way to communicate between Node.js processors. Okay. So let's talk, talk about processes and working with processes. Just let me clean up my workspace a bit. Let's create a directory. I'll call it proc for processes. Okay, so create a nice little empty file. So another little bit more advanced subject in Node.js, but still. So how do you work with the other processes? Let's first start not with Node.js processes, but generally with OS system processes. You can spawn the processes and you can work with it, their inputs and the outputs just the way that you work with any other streams, right? With uh, just a couple of gotchas, you can do that. So uh, I'll show you how to do that. Remember what we did in the first session, right? We built the application that could print the contents of the home folder uh, and save it to file. Let's do that, but with the other means. So that's last time we used no GS functions. This time let's rely on the OS to provide that information. So what I want to do, I want to have a function called spawn. Guess what it does? Yeah, it spawns the process. So we will need the module called child process. Again, this is the standard one. You don't need to download it. And there is a function called spawn. Okay, so with this function, I can spawn stuff. So I can say, I want to spawn. What I want to spawn? I want to spawn ls. And let's say I want to spawn ls with the parameter dash la. And uh, Actually, I need to put parameters in, in the array. And what will be the second parameter, second argument? Let's say I want to have home directory. Okay. This is the process. So I will spawn it. It will run. Unfortunately, if I just leave this program as it is, it will not do anything because I'm not capturing the output from that process. So I need to do that in order to have something useful. So let's save it to a variable called ls and how ls will have its own std in std out and std error so i've got this stream what do i do with this stream the easiest and the simplest way to just print it on the screen what i need to do think about it just remember the previous session okay i hope you remember pipe and we take the current process and piped it to std out. Okay, let's run it. Node proc. Okay, so I've got the listing of my home directory. It was, so I spawned this process and piped it to standard output. This is the way that it works. Also, you can capture things like the exit code. It's, it's close, I think. yeah, it's close, not exit. and check if it is okay or not. Process exited with code, code, something like this. So, awesome. Process exited with code zero, so that's fine. So this way, I mean, since this is a stream, process uh, std out is a stream, you can, you know now how to write all kind of wrappers around the command line utilities with Node.js. So let's say you want to write a Git library for Node.js that programmatically uses Git, right? The, the existing Git doesn't re-implement the protocol, just uses, uh, works as a wrapper around the existing uh, commands that Git provides. So now you can do that. You can just run Git and uh, you can 
listen to the data events or subscribe to readable events on the std out to capture what was exactly added what was the status of last push etc and so on so you can build it uh just based on the parse of the text data from that process you know how to do that so uh continuing what you can do a little bit more interesting example you can also provide the additional options to the process that you're starting right so you can for example you can tell the environment variables so those this process is going to run with environment variables and the one of the most interesting options is stdio this is the option that is the array of three streams which stands for std in std out and std error that will be used by this child process in other way in other words what you can say is that this process is going to take its input from this file and send its output to this network for example for this case i can just use my own std in process std out and process stdr so this way i'm i'm just inheriting ma i'm making this process inherit all my own std io values right and this will pretty much run absolutely the same way as it used to run but even with less code around so that's how you spawn the uh, process and uh, this way you can kind of integrate with the other applications so you can call php code from node.js and get the uh, output no problem with that absolutely you can call git or you can call some call some command line utilities from whatever you want okay so this one should be clear it is quite easy uh now let's look at the other aspect of things right so this way we spawned the processes just from the os but for node.js if you're spawning node.js from node.js it's a little bit more powerful than just for OS because what you get as the bonus bonus you get the communication protocol between the processes right so let me create something like child js and the child going to be a very simple node.js app let's say that let's just write the numbers in a row so const inc function um let's have a counter starting from one and let's increment it one by one by the way there is a funny thing actually i was trying to figure out on the previous session on debugging i was debugging a very similar uh application right so on plus plus like let's do process std out whatever console log is fine and set interval i had a problem because i was releasing the debugger and it was not returning back to this little loop so uh set interval was not resuming its work it turned out I think it is it is a bug. I think it's it's a bug in, in debugger or in V8 or somewhere else, but yeah, it's it was very weird behavior. Um let's run it H 500 millis. Okay, so that's our, our child process, super simple, super trivial application that just prints numbers one one after the other. How you can run this process out from the other process right so again i want to stress i'm not i will not just take the code and execute in the same virtual machine this code will spawn the other virtual machine the other os level process and will run that uh, node.js app separately so here i will need the function called fork and it resides in the same module which is child process fork okay so fork is my function to start other node.js vms child okay so child refers to this script here right so let's see how how that works node
Oh, thanks. Require. Thank you. Great. Yeah, there is a typo. So here what happens is I started the other process and it's like printing to the uh, console everything that that you see right now, right? So now, right now I will have like two Node.js uh, processes running at the same time. Let's see that. Grab node. Yep. So here's they are. Here's the child process running. Okay. So just to show how how that might scale, what you can do you can say just fork them. Let's have more processes and node proc. This will start a bunch of processes each working separately. Again, if you go and run it again, you'll see here's here's all our child processes that I started. Again, there is a bunch of options to specify the environment variables, to specify the uh, arguments, and specify the uh, properties of the child processes that you are spawning. So it is an easy way to spawn another extra node instance. But I mean, just a word of caution, the word of warning, spawning a VM is not as cheap as spawning, let's say, a thread in Java. Uh, it is significantly more expensive. So you can, as far as I remember, it's about like 15 megs that Node.js initially allocates in memory. I might be wrong here. Uh, and it takes roughly 30 milliseconds to spawn the uh, Node.js uh, VM, right? So if you're use, planning to use it for something high load and low latency, it's definitely not the way to do that. But uh, you can spawn a bunch of worker processes, and then you can communicate between the master process and the worker processes. And that communication is, uh, by contrast, it is very fast. So you can rely on it, and it's IPC into process communication. So let me show you how that works, how IPC works for Node.js. Let's make, instead of child printing back to the to console, right, let's let's use IPC to print back the values to the uh, parent. So what you can do, you can say that in child side, you will say process send. I'm sending something to my parent. Well, if there is no parent, it will, it will not do anything. There will be no error. So let's take the thingy and just send it as a string. Okay, awesome. The code didn't change. Um, what do we need on the receiver side? Obviously, I need back my children. And I need to listen to the messages on message. This way you can also listen to the other events like like the death of the process to respawn the new one, right? But message is exactly what you receive if you send on the other side. So you receive the message and you want to handle that message. Message here. And you can print it from the parent. So let's see how that works. So it will, I mean, the result will be exactly the same, but this time it's not through console, it's through IPC, right? Uh, and you can exchange uh, more complex data types. And uh, this way you can, I mean, it is quite easy to understand how from this little pattern, how you can evolve to something more interesting to having a worker thread processing some sort of long, long running application and then notifying the parent whenever this uh, long running operation is done. For example, let, let, let's take this as an example. You have the application that accepts images and you need to encode the image and uh, like compress the image before storing. So compression of the image is something that you definitely don't want to do in the same process as you are uh, serving the HTTP request responses because it's like a lengthy process, it's resource heavy process, so uh, it will take time, definitely. So having the worker thread doing that thing and reporting back to the parent when this thing is done, this might be a good idea to do. So, okay, so this is the, your way to uh, talk between the children and the parent process. Also in Node.js, there is a thing that is called, here it is, here's a slide called cluster. Cluster is 
again, the same idea, you can fork the child processes, child Node.js instances, but this time it's like brought on a little bit higher level cluster. Again, it is the standard module that is available in Node.js just right outside of the box and you can start uh, using it straight away, right? Um, so what cluster does? Again, spawns child processes, just like with a fork, uses IPC to speak. What it can also do, it can load balance the requests automatically. So if you have a cluster of the processes and you have a single um, HTTP port opened, cluster will make sure that the requests from that HTTP port are handled by the different running processes. So this way, what you can do, if you have 20 cores, you will have 20 worker threads and cluster load balancing the requests between them. Um, so let me just do a quick time check where we are right now. We got just uh, 20 minutes left, which is a bit of a shame because I have more information than 20 minutes, but um, I'll, I'll probably then skip writing the code for the cluster because it's quite trivial and uh, just show it on the screen and explain it on, uh, on the slide rather than typing it on the, um, in my, in my notepad, in my, uh, what is it, sublime text. So how that works, cluster, standard Node.js module, you require it, right? And you have this little flag, is master. So it will be true if you are right now in the initial starting process that uh, that spawned the, uh, the cluster itself, right? You can get the number of CPUs quite easily from the standard module called OS, right? You can get CPUs and you get you can get the lens. So for each CPU, what you can do, you call the cluster fork. The cluster fork will just take the same JavaScript file, just the same file, and it will fork it into the worker threads. So again, there will be a bunch of Node.js instances starting at this point. They will receive the same file, file but for them, cluster is master will be false. So one process starts as, as a master and there will be a bunch of processes that is equal to the CPU count that start as a slave. And well, this way uh, you will have the worker thread started, right? They will just start, they will not do anything. They will just uh, print the console message, nothing else in, in this code, right? You can go further and uh, you can use HTTP with a cluster, right? Uh, this time, instead of the, uh, instead of just printing to the output, what the cluster will do, it, it will call HTTP create server. Now, here's an interesting thing. So this code technically is executed between uh, like several, uh, several times. So there will be several virtual machines running this code, right? Because you have the slave, the worker thread executing create server. And here I, see, uh, I just type the number of the port which is, you might ask like, what the heck is happening here? Will not it just run once and on the second time it will report that the port is busy? And that's the beauty of cluster because uh, if you're running in this cluster mode, Node.js is smart enough to uh, make sure that this port is kind of shared between the, uh, between the workers. It will not be opened like seven or eight times depending on whatever is your CPU count. Uh, and clustering strategy, it will be just opened once. However, a cluster will load balance these requests between the uh, elements of the cluster, between the worker threads. So this way you can, if, if your application is stateless or your status stored somewhere in some, somewhere like Redis that is outside of Node.js, uh, you can scale it quite nicely vertically across the amount of CPUs. And uh, following the same patterns, um, you can, again, you can scale it even horizontally, but this time you will need to add something like load balancer in front, something like Nginx that will uh, support that. Okay, so that's how cluster works. Again, I will leave it up to you to verify that code and to play with it in practice. Cluster for a long, long time, it used to be the experimental module that was in unstable state. Unstable meaning it was it was marked in the documentation as unstable. In reality, it was quite stable for a long time, but now it is marked as the production, so it's stable and uh, you can use it without the fear to, to do something wrong, right? Okay, great. So we, yeah, we're, we're super effective. We covered how to start Node.js processes and we covered how to spawn Node.js processes too. So just give me one second, I'll uh, get some water and we'll continue for the last 15 minutes of the webinar.
Okay, much better now. So the last part that I want to talk about is how to organize the build process, which is again super important if you're wor working on a little bit. Oh, here's a question. Is cluster somewhat like thread pool? Not exactly. Um, it, it is logically like a thread pool, but physically it just spawns the processes, the OS level processes, not the um, not the lightweight threads like in Java, for example. Okay. Again, sorry for a bunch of Java analogies. My background before doing JavaScript, I was doing Java for a long time. So that's I'm naturally comparing the languages and the VMs and the approaches to whatever, to scalability. Okay, Grunt. It is a nice little tool that I want to introduce to you that will help you to organize the build process for your project. And again, you might be like, what? What is the build process? There is no build process. It's not like Java where you have to compile and you have to package and you have to like do a bunch of other stuff during the build process. Well, there is still a build process in Node.js as well, even though there is no compilation step, there's no packaging step, nothing like that. There is still a build process. So let me give you a quick example of what might be your build process in uh, in Node.js, right? So you might, for example, want to run your unit test as a part of your build process. And let's say you might want to use something like ESLint, right, to check if you're do the static code analysis pretty much try to find the um, possible style violations or logical errors in your code you can also do all, all kind of different stuff you can uh, as a part of build process if you're especially building for client side because this technology this uh, grunt thing it is not limited in any way to the server side it just in the scope of this webinar, we'll be using for it for Node.js, but generally it can be perfectly used for the client-side code as well, and it's mostly used for client-side code. You can minify that code, you can add the source maps. So the process, I mean, the process of building the uh, the code for production these days, it is becoming significantly more complex. So tools like Webpack, they flourish when you have Transpiler, you have uh, dependencies, you have module loading, everything like step by step forming the single bundle that you will deploy to your website. Okay, anyway, this was a bit of a um, so let's create a folder called Grunter. This will be my folder for showing. Gr um, actually, I will not create it, I'll just use the current folder. Okay, so anyway, how do you install it? npm install globally and globally you install just grunt cli grunt command line interface uh, grunt is kind of interesting it went in the interest with the interesting strategy so uh, the idea is that each project might have its individual version of grunt that it needs to be built with because i mean grunt is not always backwards compatible and some project might rely on some new features then your grunt will be uh, globally it will not be compatible right so you want to make sure that your project always builds that's why on the global level you're only installing the command line interface right and the actual executable of the grunt is installed locally per project right so i'm installing gruntly i will not hit enter right now because i already have it but if you're following you can do the same and npm install and i'll hit it and here i'll use save dev i'll explain what it, what it is in a second grunt i need to run that so what is while grunt is installing what is save dev this is called a, a development dependency a dev dependency what is dev dependency this is a dependency that is only required for the development right so once you have uh, created your project once you have done it you don't need that dependency anymore you don't need that dependency on runtime let's let's put it that way right so everything that that is like testing frameworks build utilities code checkers all those kind of developers development sorry dependencies will go to the dev dependencies block of your package json they are still installed they are still saved in package json because your friends your colleagues will need them as well to work with the project but they are just in a different section so that you don't mess to around and there is a flag for npm to install only the production dependencies if you just need them right to save time and effort okay doki so oh, okay so the next thing to do is I'll show you how Grunt works internally really quickly. Not internally, but how it is logically organized. Let's put it that way. Uh, I need to create gruntfile.js. And Grunt file is 
is a simple node module. Module exports, it should export a single function that accepts one argument that is grunt. This is your object that is your, your gateway to the grunt API. Okay, so you export this thing and inside of that uh, little function, you can create the configuration and list the task that grunt will know how to create. Each task is just a function, right? You can write your own tasks or you can download ones from internet. So I'll quickly show you how to write your own custom task first. Again, why I'm showing this little things about what is a task and uh, how to do that. I saw so many times when people like go into internet and they downloading the grunt file that does kind of the thing that they want to, but nobody really understands how the heck this grunt file works and where do I put my configuration and how do I change that uh, it uses instead of SRC, it uses the folder called GS or omitting some files. So without the understanding how the tool works internally, you just can't use it efficiently. So I just try to go from the basics and show how it works on the very atomic, on the very low level. So um, we'll register a task. And let's call this task grid. And let's give it a description. Prince gridding. And this, this task is just a function that you can print here something like console log welcome. Very stupid task, doesn't do anything. But we'll come to more interesting tasks, I promise. Now you can run grunt and put here the name of the task that you will want to start grunt grid. What? What do you mean not found? Um, Hmm. It should be found. Really, really. Register task should be there. I don't see any typos. That's 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 bothering me a little bit. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I see there is an expert. Yeah, I kind of agree. Uh, Grunt, uh, well, it's not awful. I mean, it's, it's not that bad, right? Uh, the difference between Grunt and Gulp, there's a good comment that you should use Gulp instead. Uh, there's indeed, there, there is a little bit of a battle between these two little task runners, which is Grunt and Gulp, and both of them are really, they are not a big of a, frameworks. So Gulp, uh, the biggest difference between Gulp and Grunt is that Grunt, everything, it it uh, processes everything purely sequentially, uh, while Gulp is trying to process things in the stream manner, right? So once the first file has been, for example, tested by ESLint, it is ready for minification. So minification can pretty much start in parallel. Uh, while Grunt will do it in suboptimal way, it will first run lint on every file, then it will start minification on every file. So theoretically for a big, not theoretically, but for a big project, it will make a real difference. For a small project, it doesn't really matter. Um, so yeah, the configuration, and con there is a comment that too much configuration in Grunt really depends on the modules. I mean, if, if it is, convention over configuration on the module level, then you will not have too much configuration, right? So it's pretty much the module authors that are, um, yeah, responsible for that mostly. But again, that's purely my opinion. Okay, so let's quickly jump and try to do something more interesting. So tasks can accept, accept arguments as well. So name and how you call the argument, you just do the colon, greet Joe. So it will should print welcome Joe, awesome. So you can also provide the configuration and then grunt will, you can use that config from the tasks themselves. And why it is important here, here it's not very, it will not be very uh, visually 
clear why it is important. You're just putting the configuration two lines above, but the same uh, the same mechanics will be used to configure the modules that are that don't know about the configuration. So let's put here greeting um, hi. And here instead of welcome, we'll just read the configuration parameter. Grant config. And what we need here, greeting. Okay, so that will pretty much run the task with the configuration here. We, we took it from configuration and with the parameter. And finally, you can configure the task to be the default one so that you don't have to type it. Just using the pretty much same fun function, register task, you say that you want to register something that is called default. Default is a magic name for default task. And here you want to you can here put several uh, tasks in the array, what will be the default and the sequence matters as well. So greet Joe. So this is a very basic, how you can create your own custom tasks and how grant, it's, it's really everything that it does. So it, it does a couple more things configuration wise and uh, in terms of like expand, getting the list of the files to process, uh, but Really, the core of Grant is this little thing. So you register the task, you register the sequence of the task that you want to execute, you register the configuration parameters, and Grant just runs it. So it's very, very simple. So now I'll just give a very quick demo how you can uh, make something useful out of that file. And um, firstly, we've, we've have the unit tests already. So let's use the unit tests as the first way to a uh, first step for build. And to do that, to run Mocha from Grunt, what we need to do is install the module. npm install Grunt Mocha test. Again, you can put save dev here. I just forgot, but really running out of time. So I'm trying to be really quick. So what you need, once you have a module, you need to do two things. Firstly, you need to load it. Load npm, npm tasks. And this is going to be the name of the task that we're loading. Grant Mocha test. And we need to provide the configuration for uh, this task as well. So here, I'll get rid of this thing just to keep the code smaller. Uh, here we will have mocha test and inside of mocha test we'll, we'll, we'll have something like the source for mocha gonna be everything inside source folder that ends with JS on every level. Again this is the pattern the uh, you can read more about these patterns and how they are matched in Grant documentation, but they're quite flexible. You can uh, use wildcards, you can have includes, excludes, and you can even have like the custom filter functions if you want to go really fancy. Most of the time, 95% of the time, this is pretty much what you want. You don't want anything more. So uh, default will be task mocha test. So let's see if that runs. Grant. Yay! No files to check. What? Test. Grunt. Okay, should add the item. I'm, I'm having this failed test, so let me quickly just kill that test that is failing right now. Don't want to go and figure out what's wrong with the test, especially since we're in the demo. Should add item. Don't care about you. Sorry. Don't do that in production. Never tell that Yuri showed you how to optimize your grunt build by deleting your tests. Grunt, yay, passing, green now. Okay, so we've got the uh, unit tests right now as a part of our build and let's now add something else that will be cool. Let's add ESLint. Again, a little tool that I suggest you to use no matter if you're writing uh, Node.js code or you're writing the client side code, it's just, it's just nice, it's, it's great. It's, uh, firstly, it feels like you've been set into prison and somebody tells you how exactly to write each semicolon, but at the end of the day, the benefit of the 
common style and uh, the static code analysis is greater than the pain that you feel from the tool commanding you how to <laughs> format your code, right? So I'll use another modal load npm tasks and this time i will use gruntify eslint by the way for those of you who are thinking like do i remember all this by heart like no freaking way i've got my little cheat sheet with the names of the modules and the uh configurations printouts it's lying right next to the computer so i don't remember that by heart if i need to pick something i uh i, I look at it so There's no way you can remember all those modules and all those configs, right? So for ESLint, how it works, uh, you need to ESLint, give it as well the configuration, and you can give it source files. What are the files to check? I'll just use I'll just use one file. Item store GS. Don't want again to fight with a bunch of errors that I will get from ESLint right now. Um, and that's actually, no, that's not all. We'll also need to tell it where to take its configuration, the ESLint configuration from. Okay, so that's going to be our config. Right. Actually, if I omit it, it will by default it will start checking ECMAScript five syntax to make it ECMAScript six. I need to tell it in the configuration file. Okay, awesome. And uh, finally, I don't. I need to remember to take ESLint. Whoopsie. Take ESLint and install it. npm install save dev ESLint. So we're running a little bit out of time. So I'm really sorry to keep you. A little longer than expected on Friday night, but we're almost there, promise. Ah, it's a bit slower than I expected, so I'll start writing the configuration for ESLint. And config for ESLint is really, really simple. Yes, lint JSON. There's a JSON file that um, where you tell what are the options of ESLint and you can figure the rules as well. Browser options. And I have one parser option, which is ECMAP version, which will be six. So I'm telling this is not ECMAScript five. Otherwise it will start shouting that class is the um, reserved keyword. You should not be using it in your programs. And we need to configure some rules. By default, it will not run any, any rules at all. So if your program will be synthetically correct, it will say just fine. So semicolons, if we forget a semicolons, it can be an error. This is my configuration. So OK, so theoretically, uh, let me probably run first. I will run the ESLint, and then I will run Mocha. ESLint. And then mocha test. Okay, so let's see how that works. Grunt. Yep. Keyword class is reserved. What the heck? Uh, yes, lint JSON. Here's the error. Didn't pick up the. Again, I'm I'm not really happy with the way that it reports the errors. It, sh it should have told me that my config is not found rather than this stuff, right? Parsing error. Keyword class is reserved again. Um, hmm. I don't think, okay, anyway, sorry guys, I don't see the error right now, what it is exactly, and uh, maybe there is parser options. No, it's parser up, uppercase options. I'm pretty sure about this one. I can, I can just double check for you and and run it. And it's, yeah, it's, it's trying to, to, to interpret it as the ECMAScript version 5, not, not uh, version 6. So yeah, there, there's probably some sort of a init config. Maybe it's not init config. Maybe it's something else. Sorry. 
config file. Yeah, that's fine. Yay! Should should work, please. Yay! Awesome. So now I have ECMA uh, ESLint together with the. Let me check if that works. So I'll, I'll just remove a couple of semicolons, and I should get the report that my code is crap. No, I'm not getting the report. Don't know why. Item store GS. Oh, I, I removed it from test. Okay. Need to pay attention what I type and where I type it. So let me remove here a couple of semicolons. So now that should be reported. Run. Yes. So I've got the little, little nice build, uh, build script that can pretty much make my life a little bit easier, and uh, it can report me if if I'm breaking something in my code and if my unit tests are not working. So this way you can organize your build. It might it will get significantly more complex if you're on the client side, and especially if you're using all those kind of like Angular two TypeScript with um, like tests and packaging, pack packaging and optimization and minification. So it might get significantly more hairy, but uh, still it is much better than having a bunch of tools and running them individually to check how, how are you. So the other alternative is Gulp and uh, yeah, there is the different options about the two. Uh, I suggest you to just look at both and make your choice and what is easier for you. They both pretty much on the same level. They will not, uh, both of them will have pretty similar set of capabilities. So it's not like the selection of plugins that will matter at the end of the day. It's pretty much the style of uh, those tools and again, the configuration, uh, amount of configuration and the options that you will have with either Grunt or Gulp. If you have a really big project, I, I for example, would be super fancy to know which one worked faster and how much faster was it. So that's pretty much that's pretty much it. We are now seven minutes uh, over the time of our, our webinar and uh, this is the end of uh, Node Bootcamp. So let me just quickly recap. So what we learned and where we are. So you learned the basics of Node.js. I was trying not to stress too much on the frameworks because frameworks and modules, they change so quickly in Node world that um, it's just not worth wasting too much time on it. Uh, once you know the basics of Node.js, and those basics are, I mean, not the basics in terms of the simple things, but the basics in terms of the core things, right? Once you know how Node.js works internally, how the uh, module loading works, how to handle the uh, asynchronous code, how to uh, create your own modules, how to work with the streams, again, a very big subject, very important one, how to work with network and HTTP, you're pretty much that, right? Uh, the frameworks and tools, it is just a matter of opening their web pages, going through the documentation and uh, checking how they work because uh, once you know the core, you will be able to understand tools without problem. And also we spend a significant effort and time to understand how to make your Node.js code a little bit more production ready and uh, add logging, configuration, all the different options to start up the Node.js instances and uh, run the cluster. So. I hope that this will open you the great and easy, I hope, easy pass as Node.js developers. And as usual, if you will need any kind of a help or you will have any questions about how Node.js works or how to do things better in Node.js, just let me know. So thank you very much and have a great Friday. Have a great weekend. And it was a great webinar. It was a pleasure to work with you guys and see you on the other webinars. Thank you. Have a great Friday. Bye.